Kingston, you're going to be a heartbreaker. I'm not going to lie. I just have to throw out. You know it? He knows it. And I hope we can be friends in the future, but you are going to be a heartbreaker. Thank you. See, we'll be friends. Good friends, huh? <laughs>the world to know about your story? Well, I think the number one thing I tell people whenever, you know, a conversation like this gets brought up, I think the number one thing I tell people is that nobody's going to fight your fight for you. You know, I think it's, it's one of those things where you, you want the doctors to give you the next step. You want the nurses to hold your hand and walk you through what your journey or what your process is going to be. And unfortunately that's just, as we have found out, it's just not the case. And so I just want people to know that, you know, you can advocate for yourself. You can fight that fight yourself. Everyone is strong enough. And as, as much as you think you aren't, especially I felt that way in the beginning, I just didn't think I was capable of giving Kingston what he needed. You are. Everyone's the perfect parent for their little one. And, you know, what, you'll, you'll figure it out. Everyone figures it out. Is Kingston uh, originally diagnosed? So... Actually, he was a postnatal diagnosis. Um, from the, the families I've met so far that have children with um, Anno or Micro, Micro is kind of like a sister condition to Anno. So um, Anno is where there is no presence of an eye, where Micro is the eye is underdeveloped. So very similar, uh, very similar conditions. So we have met a lot of families with children with the same condition and it seems like it's 50 50. some families uh, had a prenatal diagnosis you know they were able to see it in the ultrasound uh seems like a lot of families unfortunately had a postnatal diagnosis so in kingston's case he was postnatal um i actually was the first one to notice it um interestingly enough um he was just a couple hours old, you know, how babies are all squishy and don't really open their eyes much anyway. And so I think in, you know, the first few hours, you know, he was just, you know, a little cute baby um, and nobody had really noticed that he wasn't opening his eye. Um, and then finally, you know, I was holding him and I finally turned to the nurse and just said, you know, I think his face needs to be wiped a little more. Um, you know, he, his right eye's just not opening. I think he might just have some he hadn't had a bath yet. So I said, you know, I think he just needs to be wiped one more time. Um, his eyes kind of stuck closed. And I truly, it was as innocent as that. I just thought his eye wasn't opening. Um, and so when she came to kind of clean his face one more time and kind of like help, you know, open the eye, we realized that there was no eye to open. Um, so that was kind of the moment it all started. Uh, that's kind of what led to the neonatologist coming in and ophthalmology and ocular plastics and all of that. Oh, okay. thank, thank you. Thank you very much for bringing me his trash. Oh thank my you. God. Uh, <laughs> so kind, so kind. You you brought your trash, do you wanna sit with me? Eh? No. No, okay. No. <laughs> um, also Kingston's is a little bit more rare in the case that he actually has no other known genetic abnormalities, um, which is kind of strange because typically we have been told that most children that have anno have some genetic disorder that has, you know, caused the anophthalmia. Um, we did genetic testing with him. They've done MRIs and all sorts of fun stuff. And as far as we can tell, everything else is considered normal. The thing with, with his condition is it's a constant um, treatment. There, it's not like, you know, heart surgery where you have one surgery now and maybe another in six months. You know, thank you. Um, every few weeks, a cookie, thank you. Um, every few weeks, we're having to go get a new conformer. Thank you. Um, we're having to go get new conformers. We're having every day. Um, we stretch, which I know doesn't really make much sense to people who don't really know what's going on. But, you know, we're constantly messing with this eye. We're constantly getting, you know, larger conformers, surgery to, to do something new. Um, so it's, it's like an everyday thing. You know, it's not like, you know, you know, something that we can just let go. So right. I would say probably that having something as for us would be very uncomfortable. Somebody messing with your eye or around your face constantly. He's just so, 
you know, he doesn't even think about it. You know, his ocularist always says, she's like, he's such a good patient. He's like the best baby because he doesn't pull away and he doesn't cry and he doesn't budge. And she's like, I have adults that don't want, you know, because as adults, we're like, why, why are you touching my face? You know? Um, so, I mean, I would say that would be the biggest challenge. It's just like the constant, you know, but for him, he just seems to go with it. He, he goes with the flow and doesn't really seem to mind. And you should not say to someone who has a diagnosis. Okay. From a parent's perspective, I've obviously haven't experienced a lot of the things he has or will experience. Um, but I would say the one thing as a parent that probably bothers me the most is the way you word things. So I am super happy to answer questions. I love when people actually ask, you know, um, it's the perfect opportunity to inform and educate. I think it's amazing. But I think the way in which we approach those questions, you know, when you're in the grocery store and you have this cute little baby and you're already hormonal and emotional and you say, what's wrong with him? Probably not the nicest way to go about it. So I think just, you know, using common sense and being kind with your approach is probably more so my answer to that versus like what you're actually saying. I think it's just the way you approach it um, because you can tell a genuine approach versus, you know, a, mm, what's wrong with them, you know, makes a big difference. Absolutely. What does Kingston like to do for fun? Eat Oreos. Yes. Eat or eat Oreos. That's what he's doing right now. Is that good? Okay. I'll be right out. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I wish there was somebody who would give me cookies. It's like, he's eating cookies. He's giving you cookies. I mean, number one, number one, number one would be anything his sister's doing. He is her shadow. I mean, when I tell you they're obsessed with each other, that is probably an understatement. Um, it's really fun because, you know, I was actually the youngest of three girls. And so I didn't know how the brother sister relationship would be, you know, having an older sister and a younger brother. Other and you know if she would be motherly hi. towards him or if she would be hi, like, mommy. Hi, hi. Hi. <laughs> Has he reached any developmental milestones recently that you're super proud of? Um, it, there's been a few. So when he like basically from the minute he was born, you know, I part of that advocacy, I was like, okay, who does he need to see? What there do we need to see therapists? You know, what what do we need to do? And so, um, pretty early on, we got in with actually two different types of therapists. Um, one, just OT, you know, making sure that he was reaching his milestones when he needed to, you know, the, the normal. Um, and then another was actually more of like a family oriented therapy. It, it, she was actually coming to our home with our family, you know, whether it was me and my husband or Noelle was here and it, she was giving us tools to, so hi, more trash. Thank you. I <laughs> well, you can go put it in the trash. You got it. Um, so it was actually really cool because she was actually giving us the tools to support Amanda. him. So it wasn't her necessarily Amanda. working hands on with him. It was her saying like, okay, well, you know, he, he's not really going to have clumsy. Ow. He said, <laughs> you okay. Um, she said, you know, he, he's not really going to have depth perception. That may be something that he's going to have to learn over time that his brain will have to kind of help him with. And so she would say, you know, things like, you know, Arrange, like when you're sitting with him, arrange things to a certain side of him, you know, so that it's not like on the blind side. So um, it, that was really nice. But um, one of the, the reason I'm telling you that is one of the first things that both of our therapists said is, you know, he might, you know, be a little bit of a later walker, you know, don't compare him to Noelle. Noelle was very early. I mean, she walked at like eight months old. So she was very early. And, and they said, you know, balance is going to be a little bit different, you know, depth perception is going to be hard, just, you know, be aware of these things as we're going, we're not going to use the normal milestone timeline. But this boy at 12 months old, he was walking and he, you know, I mean, a lot of the things that you just kind of, you know, not major, I mean, whether he was walking at 12 months old or 18 months old, you know, as long as we, you know, get there with him, but you know, in your head, you put these markers in the sand and say, okay, well, maybe by 18 months old, he'll be there. And so when he was like really progressing and kind of even proving them wrong, I was like, you know what, you know, I'm not worried about him. I'm, I know that he's, you know, he's going to be fine. So that probably was the biggest one was the walking just because again, we were kind of told so much. Is there anything else you would like for people at home to know about your story? Um, you know, Oh, if I could just, if I could just take two hours and just like word vomit our, our whole story, I would love to. I, you know, I want people to understand Kingston's journey. I have so many people ask me. I actually, 
you know, it was probably two months ago now. This is awful. I did like, I did a poll on Instagram asking, you know, who would like to know more about Kingston's, you know, journey and, you know, that kind of stuff. And every, I had like over 300 yeses. People were like, yeah, tell us more. Do that, you know, awesome. and I haven't done it yet. I know. <laughs> I know. My sister tells me every day, she's like, so when are you going to get around to those answers? Like you were going to do a Q and a and everything. And I was like, I, I, I know that's awful. Um, so I, I want to share his story. I want to be as open as possible. I want to be that source of, you know, comfort and support for other people who are just starting their journey. Um, because it was pretty lonely in the beginning. I mean, nobody had ever heard of this condition, myself included. Um, I didn't even know it was possible just to not have an eye. Like I, it was just something so unknown, you know, and I feel like I had to do so much of the research myself The the doctors didn't hand it to me on a silver platter. And so I just, I don't know what, I guess, I don't know how to word it. I just want people to like, know that like, you know, if you ever have questions or if you ever want to know things, like it's okay to ask, like it, it, it's okay. And it, and you can't be mad at your kids. And I always say this on Instagram, like don't shush your kids when, when they ask a question, like it's, it's out of pure curiosity. It's not being mean. It's not being rude, but like shushing them is the rude part. You know, that's the part that's like comes across. Just say like, well, say hi to you, to, you know, your friend or, you know, wave to them or something like that. So, you know, I think, you know, if, if that, if, if there was anything that I could tell people about our journey, it's just, it would, that would be it. It would be that, you know, you don't have to like look away. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to, you know, be scared to interact with these people. Um, just, you know, like I said, be nice, be friendly. Kingston's like the friendliest kid on the planet. Hey everyone, Gary Magro here from a special community. I can't thank you enough for watching this video. And if you like this video, please click on some of the more videos around our YouTube page. We are just trying to give a voice to countless people in our neurodiverse community. So please, if you can, subscribe to our video page. And then you'll also get to see a little bit more about my story from nonverbal autism to today being a professional speaker. Thanks so much, y'all.